So much of the fashion industry is built upon illusion. No, I mean, it's not even built upon illusion. It relies upon illusion, illusions that it creates itself. At the top level, it's, it's that illusion of glamour, of self-importance, of fashion trends being important, like so important. If things are in style or out of style, like that's, that's an illusion right there. It sells the illusion that if we buy the right thing from the right brand, obviously at the right time, we will fit in. We'll find success. We'll be happy. All of our problems will be fixed by the right pair of jeans or shoes. There's literally advertising on fashion blogs, in magazines, even trickling into our inbox that tells us that the right thing at the right time will change our lives. It also sells the illusion that newness matters, that we need a lot more clothing and shoes than we actually need. It sells us the illusion of a relationship with brands, that liking a brand or a store like Anthropology or Free People or Madewell, pick your favorite, is a personality characteristic. I'm going to go ahead and say yes. I at least 50% believe in astrology as a Leo with a Gemini rising and a Cancer moon. I can say that, yeah. I do think about astrology. (laughs) I definitely believe in astrology way more than I believe that any of these brands that we like and follow care about us at all or define our personalities. But this is a very successful illusion because people do build intense loyalty to brands entangled within their personalities. I mean, someone recently told me on TikTok that I was an ignorant asshole because I said anthropology was fast fashion. I have had people fight with me to defend Nike's honor. Once again, would these brands do the reverse? Would they go to bat for you? No. And should we be going to bat for them anyway? No. But these brands have sold us the illusion that our love for these brands, or even our just liking what they sell, is entangled with our personalities. And so it creates this illusion that we should fight to defend them. Wild when you say it out loud, right? But those aren't the only illusions that fashion is selling us. It sells us the illusion of very important, never to be repeated again, I swear to God, clearance extravaganzas. It makes me laugh because we know by now that there is always another sale. But the number of times I've seen a brand say, we never do this or we'll never do this again. Yeah, you will. You definitely will. In fact, the next sale might even be better. It sells us the illusion of Black Friday deals and Cyber Monday deals and just deal after deal after deal. And most importantly in the fast fashion era, it sells us the illusion that the things we are being sold are good or great or luxe. Love that word. Whenever I see luxe in an email about a product or a post about it, product description, what have you, I know this is a low quality product. (laughs) That influencer, Danielle Bernstein, who makes very bad fast fashion under the label, we were what, always uses the word lux. And I've seen those clothes in the thrift store. They are the opposite of luxurious. Let me tell you, perhaps lux actually means low quality because if they weren't low quality, you could just say the whole word luxurious. I don't know. Fast fashion sells us the illusion that everything they sell us is a necessity, that it will, all these things will bring us great joy. It sells us the illusion that these things are a great value. As a person who has worked the behind the scenes for so long and now has the luxury, not lux, but the actual full word luxury of being able to fully process it from a distance, we use 
in our meetings, behind the scenes, we use the same verbiage over and over again that actually speaks to the illusion we are creating. And you don't see it until you're not in it anymore. Cause you're like, wait, people don't talk like this in the real world outside of fashion. We say things like, Ooh, that looks expensive because of course, as you know, by now it is not expensive. We just want something that looks expensive, that has the illusion of value, right? We'll say, Ooh, this feels so cozy. That's always said while touching something made of polyester or a complex, inexpensive yarn that is not actually cozy or warm at all, but is very affordable. And then, of course, to bring back my favorite here, this looks so luxe. When someone says that to you, it means it like costs $2 to make, seriously. Another one we would say is, ooh, that looks almost like real leather, silk, wool, cashmere. Pick your favorite nice material to throw in there. As soon as someone says that, you know it's completely made of plastic. It often is followed up by, it almost looks like real leather, silk, wool, cashmere. All the verbiage we use that is supposed to be complimentary to say, this product is great is built upon reinforcing these illusions of quality, of luxury, of good, desirable stuff. And from a marketing perspective, we use words that further reinforce different illusions. Conscious, right? This means you are just buying this makes you a more elevated, more conscious, thoughtful person. Sustainable. Well, we know that 99% of the time when a brand is selling us that term, they're not selling us the full picture, right? Vegan leather, what an incredible illusion right there, right? Because really most fabrics are vegan. Most materials are vegan. I'm pretty sure my iPhone is vegan. But when we use it with the word leather, we're trying to sell you this feeling of doing a better thing for the world but really what we're selling you is plastic. Here's another one that I love. And Danny actually called this out a couple of episodes ago when we talked about sweaters. Imported. Yeah, guess what? Most of our clothes are imported. Why don't you tell me where they're from? No, imported sounds exotic, fancy, right? Like, oh, these were imported from somewhere else. Never mind that almost all of our clothes are imported. <laughs> uh size inclusive. Love that one. You're like, oh, a new size inclusive collection. Oh, you go up to XL, 2XL. Oops, sorry. Yeah, we're not like really size inclusive. We're just selling the illusion of size inclusivity. Meanwhile, as we've been discussing for so long, the clothes themselves just aren't actually good. The zippers are already a problem on the first wear. The fabric makes us stinky, itchy, and hot. The fit is not great. I don't know about you, but every garment I try on helps me identify something that might be wrong about myself that I wasn't aware of before. Maybe my arms are too long or too wide. My boobs are too big or not the right shape. My torso is simultaneously too short but sometimes too long. My feet are too big to get through the leg hole. It never, or at least not for a long time, occurred to me that my body was not the problem. The way the garment was designed and made was the problem. And I worked in the industry. I sat in the meetings where we said, well, it'll fit someone. And I still thought I was the problem. That's how deep this illusion goes. You have to live the illusion when you're working in the industry to stay sane. The reality is that new clothes are kind of garbage these days. A few episodes ago, I talked about this at length with Danny of Picnic Wear in terms of sweaters, but the info we shared there applies to every kind of clothing and just about everything outside of clothing that is sold to us every day. And there are a lot of reasons why this is happening. Some are obvious and some are hidden. 
This episode is part one of two, where I will break down both the very obvious, you know, like all of these deals, 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 and the hidden. We're going to talk about things like air freight, returns, free shipping, and so much more. These obvious and hidden reasons that clothing is just garbage these days, because it's not a coincidence. It's a function of a lot of things that many of us are completely unaware of. And that's by design, us not knowing. Because if we knew what was really happening, we would know what we were really buying. And it would shatter our illusions about fashion and shopping and clothing and trends. The industry needs us to be under the spell of these illusions in order to succeed, to keep going. What would happen if we all knew the truth? How would it change our relationship with clothing? Would we see a larger social change in terms of clothing and shopping? Would the industry finally have to change its ways? Welcome to Clothes Horse. I'm your host, Amanda, and this is episode 187, part one of two about why clothes are kind of garbage these days. I've been doing a little series on Instagram and TikTok that you may have seen. We're going to go into a lot more detail about the things I've discussed so far, and hopefully you'll learn even more, even if you've already seen those videos. Before we jump into all that, I know many of you probably want an update on Remake and what I talked about in the last episode, and I guess I don't have much to say to you, but I'll just say it didn't work out well, um, meaning like I actually felt worse at the end than at the beginning. Um, I had some really not great interactions with the CEO of Remake, and Ultimately, they, I think, tried to discredit me or something with a quasi-apology post on their profile that they turned off comments on. And I think they were trying to say that I was presenting inaccurate information about what had happened, but in fact, I wasn't at all. So, and I had, I have proof of all that. So the whole thing was just, well, it's really bad because sometimes all you just have to do is say you're sorry and that's it. And this turned into a whole other thing where I was unable to sleep. I was being like harassed. It was very, very stressful. And, uh, yeah, I'm glad it's over. Definitely learned. I learned a lot of stuff that is important for me to consider when I think about how we're going to grow the slow fashion community into a movement and how we're going to make change and how we're going to treat one another well. And yeah, I mean, I guess that's the silver lining of it all. Um, Obviously, I'm not going to be ever doing any work with Remake, but that doesn't mean that if you work with Remake right now or have in the past that you should discontinue. Once again, we're all doing really important work. I know for many of you, Remake has helped you find your voice, has helped you find a way that you can help change these things. And that is not something that we can discount ever, right? No matter what happened to me or how I feel about it, the work we're doing is so much more important than that. So keep doing what you're doing. And I hope I never have to talk about this again, but I think I'm going to be processing it for a long time. So maybe I will. I have no idea. It was a pretty humiliating, stressful kind of like sickening experience for me. Okay, well, that's depressing. So let's have a little bit of a palate cleanser. Let's listen to an audio essay from Alicia of Worth Mending. Hi, I'm Alicia from Worth Mending. And to anyone who knows me, I don't think it's a surprise that I run my own business. I've always struggled with fitting in, and the many, many jobs I worked before starting Worth Mending were no exception. I was feeling really unwell about accepting a contract renewal in the position I was at back in 2020, 
So it was freeing to be able to take the emerging COVID-19 pandemic as an open door to run, even though I had no idea what I was going to do next. I definitely didn't know at the time that worth mending would become my full-time job. I dabbled a bit over the years with selling upcycled sewn goods on Etsy and, come to think of it, totally sold at my first craft markets back in 2019, but at the time, that was just something I was toying with over the winter instead of getting a throwaway part-time gig in my off-season. I just went and checked the calendar to make sure I got the timeline right. So back in February 2020, I launched a Kickstarter campaign for a product my partner Scott and I had been designing just for fun and for ourselves since April 2019. We finally got the gumption to try and sell it, which, trust me, was a big deal. This is the same product that is still the core of what we do with Worth Mending, and maybe I should just jump in and tell you all about it so that's all clear and out of the way. We call it the Swift Darning Loom. It's a mending tool we make ourselves with part-time help from two friends using upcycled materials like broken hardwood furniture and bicycle spokes. Our darning loom helps you to quickly and easily create woven patches to mend clothes. It's most famous for socks, because that's what everyone thinks of first when they think of darning, but it can actually handle a pretty wide range of both knit and woven fabrics. I have a whole bunch of videos available on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube where you can see it in action. Find me anywhere as Worth Mending, or check out the hashtag SwiftDarner. You'll see knee patches, elbow patches, socks, of course. You'll see jeans, jackets, sweaters, and mittens all being mended, and even some really delightful tiny tapestries. We offer different product bundles, including accessories to turn the darning loom into a mini weaving loom, just for fun. So back to our Kickstarter story. Turns out the campaign reached its goal in five hours, and the final trickle of backer rewards sold out within 10 days. Honestly, being there and seeing the hype among my friends and followers on Instagram, I wasn't super surprised that it sold out so quickly, but as we watched the numbers keep climbing, Scott absolutely could not believe this was happening. It was exciting, but a little stressful when we realized our next step was actually manufacturing this product we'd only made like six one-off prototypes of to date. We spent the whole spring and summer of 2020 making and figuring out how to make 120 of these curious little tools that a year prior I'm sure we didn't know existed. Post-campaign, you can still buy them and... We have learned so much since then. They are better than ever. You'll find everything on our website, which is worthmending.com. We're still making new batches all the time, no longer in our basement, but at our local makerspace. It's been such a gift to be able to embed ourselves in such a vibrant, community-minded group of creative people who also value collective decision-making, sharing space, sharing skills, and of course, sharing tools so we can all have access to way more than anyone could fit in their sequestered suburban garage. We love hosting workshops there, sharing as much of our scraps of scraps wood as folks will take, and just working together to make this space more vibrant, welcoming, and accessible to the broader community. I've also had the opportunity to collaborate on events with public libraries, the tool library, and local charities and not-for-profits to spread the good word of mending, sewing, and low-waste living in a world where we all know the propaganda machine of newness is trying hard to hardwire us to buy more all the time. But it's my personal mission to show off how much we can do with what we already have. At Worth Mending, we love the creative challenge that comes from using secondhand and discarded materials, and we dabble in other upcycled goods too, like our holiday ornament kits we make from cereal boxes. But as I said, the Swift Darning Loom is our main event. They keep us super busy, to say the least, and constantly on our toes. 
On the technical side, over the last four years, we've learned a lot about how to manufacture things in a consistent way and how different that is from making something once. We have so many really cool custom tools and jigs and clamps and code that we're constantly tweaking to make it easier and more efficient to get a consistent product. We've learned a ton about woodworking and metalworking and inventory management and marketing and ergonomics and asking for help. We are always learning and experimenting. That's what keeps us going, especially as neurodivergent, queer, anti-capitalist people who were never handed a roadmap that made any sense to us. We're still learning about time and energy management and planning ahead and taking breaks because we also learned that it's extremely hard to maintain good work-life boundaries when your work kind of feels like an extension of your personality. But we're so grateful to be where we are, to have so many amazing customers and connections all over the world who also believe that the simple act of mending our clothes is an important step in building a better and more just world. A big part of what makes this business feel like a success to us is how we're able to stay committed to our core personal values. I physically couldn't do this otherwise. We love that we can play and create, pay our bills, and be part of a movement pushing for circularity and responsibility in resource use so that everyone can benefit from the great wealth of this planet, not just those at the imperial core. In this way, sure, we sell darning looms, and we love nothing more than to see them out doing good in the world, but we do our best to anchor that in our lessons that we've learned through anti-oppression movements and utopian thinkers throughout history who are constantly pushing against power and towards the horizon of total liberation. Thanks so much, Amanda, for giving me the opportunity to try and put words to some of this stuff. And of course, for everything you've taught me over the years through Clothes Horse. To everyone listening, please find me online and reach out, send thoughts and questions and pics of your mending. I know we're all busy and tired and exhausted from just trying to survive in this capitalist hellscape, but it's so awesome and inspiring and helpful and healing to connect over our shared passions. Once again, it's worth mending everywhere and worthmending.com. See you around. Thanks, Alicia, for taking the time to record such an amazing audio essay. And I got to say, I decided to put Alicia in this week's episode because I noticed that some people were showing up in the comment section of one of their reels, basically doing the whole like, it's classic at this point, right? Why is this so expensive? It feels overpriced and arbitrary in regards to Worth Mending's Swift Loom. Now, Alicia already told you all about how these are made, and you can learn more at worthmending.com. So the price totally makes sense to me, and I hope it makes sense to you too. But as I've been saying for years, the era of fast fashion and really fast everything Well, it's messed up our sense of value and price. And I think we have become accustomed, maybe even comfortable with the idea that many things will not be in our lives for very long because they'll break or they'll be unrepairable. We just accept that as how it goes. When things don't last for a long time, it feels like they should be inexpensive because, you know, we're going to have to buy another one soon especially since more and more things are intentionally impossible to repair. The idea of the worth mending swift loom is that you only need one like ever and it will actually save you money in other ways because you can repair and extend the life of socks, pants, sweaters, hats, towels, blankets, and really like any textile in your life. I mean, this is something that has a value beyond the price you pay for it. But it also is in direct conflict with something called planned obsolescence. Now, we've talked here about that before, but I think we should review it again, especially since some of you are new to Close Horse. We need to unpack what that term planned obsolescence means. So the Oxford Dictionary has a great definition. 
a policy of producing consumer goods that rapidly become obsolete and so require replacing, achieved by frequent changes in design, termination of the supply of spare parts, and the use of non-durable materials. Now, they say it's a policy, and I think for some companies that might be true. I think it's kind of a strategy. I think sometimes it's a little bit of an accident. Sometimes I think it's the combination of the two. Let's break down what this all really means using the different types of tactics within that definition, right? So first, frequent changes in design. Okay, so this one harkens back to the 1920s. By then, the automobile industry was somewhat oversaturated. Basically, everyone who could afford a car had one. But the industry, like fashion, like every industry, was built upon this idea of constant growth, making more money each year than the previous year. The car makers weren't going to say like, well, we're doing pretty good. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. No, it has to grow, right? And General Motors executive Alfred P. Sloan Jr. had an idea. What if there were new models of cars each year with different design changes, different features, like different headlights or colors, you know, just a reason to motivate people to buy? Even if they already had a car, they would want to buy a new one anyway. And you know what? It worked. In fact, Ford was sort of like, we're not doing that. That's a bad idea. But GM was like, no, we believe in this. And actually what happened is that GM, General Motors, became the predominant car company in the U.S. thanks to this strategy. And now every every car brand puts out a new model of car every year, even if they're just kind of the same as the previous year. We see this play out in many categories now, particularly in the area of electronics and tech. I mean, here's one great example that is from our lives, even if we don't own a car. Think about the constant stream of new iPhones. I mean, we all know someone, or perhaps even ourselves, that buys every new iPhone that comes out, or at least did for a while, right? People would wait in line every time a new iPhone was announced, even though they barely had the other one, maybe not even for a full year. And it raises that question, like, do you really need the newest phone when yours is already functional? Probably not. But it's the same kind of thing that was working back in the 1920s for General Motors. Like, it plants that desire to buy something. And I think there's also a certain level of I don't know, like your identity being built around having the newest, the latest, the greatest, right? There are people who swap cars pretty regularly into the newest, greatest car. You know, that's much more expensive than a phone. In terms of apparel, just like fashion as a whole, it's all about trends. That's where the frequent changes in design come into play. So if you feel like your skinny jeans are out of style, even though they have plenty of use left in them, you'll feel compelled to buy a new kind of jeans in a different silhouette. It's the same kind of motivation that drives someone to buy the newest iPhone or the newest car. And there are many people who also just want to be first to adopt any fashion trend while others live in fear of being behind. Of course, style blogs, influencers, magazines, and even television and film help reinforce this idea of things being in style or out of style. So if you felt that way, which I certainly have as well, don't be embarrassed. The world is sort of engineered to make us feel like things are out of style or that we need the new version. Number two, in terms of the way planned obsolescence works, is termination of the supply of spare parts. And this is a classic for many appliances, vehicles, and electronics. Even if you've held onto your phone for a really long time, you will reach a point where the battery no longer works and can't be replaced, or that it can no longer update itself to the latest operating system. Yeah, operating systems, also a part of planned obsolescence. Because after a while, if you want to use the newest apps or the most updated versions of the apps, you need to be updating your operating system. And if your phone or your computer can't do that, 
Well, guess what? You're going to go buy a new one. Many companies, I'm looking at Apple, have actually taken it one step further by making themselves the only real option to repair your devices in the first place. Often the process and waiting time is so arduous that people end up just like giving up and just buying a new laptop or iPhone. In the world of apparel, well, fashion has kind of lucked out in that many of us no longer know how to repair our clothing in the first place. And as an added bonus, I know because I've worked on these projects, uh, brands use a lot of fabrics, buttons, zippers, and other trims that we actually can't find anywhere else as customers. So sometimes finding that replacement part is kind of impossible, especially if we're trying to make the garment look like it did when it was brand new, rather which is the, this is how I like to look at repairing clothing rather than looking at repair as a moment of customization, like an opportunity to uniquely own our clothing via different buttons, threads, patches, and so on. And I think this idea and this idea of visible mending and repair as a way we put our unique signature on something, I think this is picking up a lot of momentum, but Any of you who have actually worked in mending and alteration know that most people come in wanting the garment to look brand new when it's done. When you have that kind of expectation and you can't find the so-called replacement parts to make that happen, well, it makes you move through clothes a lot faster. And lastly, from the techniques of planned obsolescence, there is the use of non-durable materials. Remember when iPhone screens shattered with like the most minor falls and then we all had to spend money on cases to protect them? I mean, what a genius money-making scheme because not only did people sell a lot more iPhones, but the fragility of phones as a whole has created an entire industry out of making cases, replacement headphones, screen protectors, pop sockets, and so much more. It's made us think we even need a new case periodically just because. And here's an example of planned obsolescence, kind of subpar design, low quality materials leading to even more sales of other items. So much money and waste has been generated by the creation of a phone that is essentially designed to break. And clothing has become very similar, perhaps not intentionally. I will be explaining later why fabric and zippers are so bad now. But it's true that with many of us barely having enough time to sleep and eat because we are working so much, The low quality fabric and trims of clothing often lead to us just buying something new because we can't repair them and we are used to having to replace clothing pretty often. There is so much planned obsolescence intentionally or otherwise within the fast fashion model. I do want to be clear that planned obsolescence is part of every industry right now. And it exists because it gets us to buy stuff more often, to spend more money, to let them, you know, going back to the idea of the car in the 1920s, everyone who was going to buy a car had a car. There was no one left to really sell a car to. Ah, we need to give people a new reason to keep spending money. Whereas if we sold them a good quality product, they might not need to buy another one for a long time. And how are we going to get that exponential growth year after year? Oh yeah, we're going to plan it that way, right? We're going to plan that people will have to come back. We will think of new ways to get them to come back and buy again. Furthermore, low quality items are less expensive to make and therefore more profitable. It's a win-win for most companies. They make more money off of everything they sell and you'll be coming back again and again to buy it again. And, you know, like I said earlier, planned obsolescence has gotten us comfortable with things not lasting and needing replacement. And you know what? We're all often fine with that as long as the price is low, right? We look for value, meaning deals and low prices, but we are sold something with little value in terms of longevity, quality, and fit. It's really messed up, right? It it makes me angry when I think about it. 
I'm hoping that this pair of episodes, as well as the episode I did with Danny about sweaters, will help you understand how messed up pricing is right now and how low quality the stuff really is. I also hope you will understand why it's important for us to take that time and effort to sort of undo our current concept of value. Because I think what we have been trained to think of as a good deal, and I mean this in regards to anything we buy, is fundamentally untrue. It's built from all of the illusions that brands and industries are selling us right now. The last thing I want to say to you on the topic of planned obsolescence is something that you're probably already picking up here, but let's say it out loud anyway, because you know, sometimes it just feels good to say it out loud, right? There is a clear connection between this process, this strategy of planned obsolescence and overconsumption. We are sort of forced to consume more than we would because we are sort of forced to consume more than we would because we have no choice if we want to have functional items. And all of you who have put off getting a new phone as long as humanly possible, you know what I'm talking about here. First, you can only keep a charge for like an hour. So suddenly the phone is plugged in all the time. Soon you can only open one app at a time. Soon calls and texts start getting dropped. And then finally, you're kind of backed into a corner where you have to buy a new one. It's kind of similar with clothing because People want to feel good about what they're wearing. They don't want to feel like they're wearing something out of date. They don't want to be embarrassed. Being embarrassed is like the worst feeling ever. So they go and buy more stuff. And while some parts of planned obsolescence are based on the illusion of trends that fast fashion is serving us or the illusion of the newest thing being the best, like Apple is selling us, Ultimately, planned obsolescence is a big contributor to large global issues like the plastic pollution crisis, the high carbon footprint of all that shopping and shipping, and even just wasted resources like water. In other words, planned obsolescence is killing our planet and making life harder for everyone living on it. It is not okay. And it's time for us to push back by recognizing that we are being tricked. We are being ripped off. We are stuck on this like hamster wheel of shopping that robs us of our financial stability. And if you want to get riled up, this is a good thing to get riled up about. And this is a thing that I think we can change via legislation, via our own consumer behavior, via our own feedback to these brands and boycotting the ones who take our money and give us garbage in exchange. Founded by third-generation designer Emily LeMandry, MLE is a sustainable accessories brand for the modern gentlewoman. The majority of MLE pieces are made to order in the Catskills by a team of skilled craftswomen in an effort to manufacture as sustainably as possible using remnant, upcycled, and eco-friendly materials. Standout pieces include the Gentlewoman's Agreement Collection, featuring a magnetic hand-shaped clasp and inspired by women working together. MLE also makes statement hair clips from eco-friendly cellulose acetate and handbags from fabric sustainably sourced from New York's Garment District. You can find us at madebyMLE.com. That's madeby, letter M, letter L, letter E, dot com, or on Instagram at madebyMLE. Use code CLOTHESHORSE for 10% off your first order. Before we start unpacking the reasons that clothing is so low quality these days, I thought we would walk through the design and production process just a little bit, specifically to understand how so much disappointing clothing is created in the first place. 
Danny and I talked about this at length in our sweaters episode, and if you haven't listened to that one yet, you should, but it bears repeating again, especially in the context of all clothing. It was interesting. You know, anytime I post something on Instagram, I also post it on TikTok. And a lot of people were showing up on TikTok to be like, okay, well, now that you've talked about sweaters, can you talk about outerwear or t shirts, et cetera? And it's like, well, actually, everyone, it's the same for all the clothes we buy and probably everything we buy. It's important to start by saying that no one working in buying, design, and production gets up every morning and says, wow, you know what? I can't wait to make even more low quality, disappointing clothes that totally rip off our customer. Nope. Not at all. Not at all. We don't even say that in meetings. We all come in with the best intentions, but our best intentions. I mean, I have worked with so many incredibly talented, smart, thoughtful people over the years, and not one of them is interested in making bad clothes, okay? They all came into this because they were passionate about something. But our best intentions, our desire to make something amazing, our creativity, it's all really reined in by the targets that come from our executive teams. As I've mentioned before, fashion, like any other industry, operates under the assumption that this year's sales will be higher than last year's and next year will be higher than this year and on and on and on. This is what's called a positive comp. When your sales are lower than last year, that's called a negative comp. And that, my friends, is not a happy place to be. As a buyer, it means that you will probably be getting yelled at a lot. You'll be under a lot of pressure and scrutiny and you might lose your job. As a buyer, sales always have to be higher than last year, even no matter what's happening in the outside world. Oh, a global pandemic? Oh, so? A recession? Oh, well. People having to pay back their student loans? Not my problem. You can't even use the weather as an excuse, right? It's all your fault. You're like the the weight of the business that probably underpays you is on your shoulders, In addition to sales being higher year after year after year, profitability also has to be higher every year. As a buyer, your margin goal will be increased each year. Margin is a measurement of the profitability of your business. And I could talk to you about retail math like all day because yes, it's a real thing. It has its own vocabulary and there's a lot of philosophy and strategy wrapped up in it. Margin is just one metric within retail math that really tries to capture the profitability of each item that you buy and each item that you sell, because often the margin it sells at is lower than the margin you bought it at, because as we know, more and more stuff sells on some kind of sale at this point. So yeah, the margin has to be higher every year. This means that either everything you buy and develop this year has to cost less than it did last year, or you have to be pricing it higher. Well, raising prices in apparel and accessories is rarely a good idea in the fast fashion era. Even with all of the inflation that we have been experiencing globally over the last few years, clothing is still less expensive now than it was in the 90s, even if it's a little bit more expensive than it was in 2020. Because there is considerable price resistance when it comes to clothing. Customers just don't want to pay more. Why? I mean, it makes sense to me because they don't expect that they will be able to wear an article of clothing for very long, either thanks to quality issues or just fashion trends moving so fast. Why would you invest in it, right? So this means buyers probably aren't going to raise the retail prices to hit the margin targets that they have been given. They'll just source cheaper stuff. Now, these margin targets and sales goals all come from the top down, starting with the executive team, then being parceled out by category to the buying team. And when they create these targets, they're looking at a lot of factors. For one, the amount of sales they need to hit to make shareholders and investors happy. Once again, 
if your sales aren't as good as last year, already your stock price is going to take a hit. Or if you are not a publicly traded company, but you have investors, investors are going to be grousing about this. There's going to be concern. Like you should be growing every year. That's the belief. I don't believe that personally, but that is that is how the industry works. Next, they're going to be thinking about the amount of gross profit they need to generate in order to cover operating expenses while also paying out dividends. Basically, gross profit is what you have left after you deduct the cost of making the clothes, and that money needs to cover all of your expenses with actual net profit left over at the end, right? So they're going to be engineering all of this through just a massive amount of spreadsheets and calculations and speculation and conversation. The expenses of running a big retailer and brand have changed a lot in the fast fashion and e-commerce era. There are sort of like unexpected costs associated with selling stuff online that most retailers didn't understand 10 years ago when e-commerce, like, you know, selling stuff online was first blowing up, when social media was first becoming a thing. And these expenses, which like, trust me, have hit some companies really hard and confused the heck out of them. uh, They're trying to figure out how to make up those costs. And they do that by driving up the profitability of each item when it is initially sold. The kinds of things I'm talking about in terms of unexpected expenses, we're going to be unpacking in this episode and the next episode. And it's things like returns, free shipping, air freight, so much more, things that didn't exist before. But what these factors, these expenses mean in terms of the buying and design process is that we are given much higher margin targets to cover those expenses. And I will tell you, I sat down today, I got out the calculator and I was like thinking about what stuff cost when I started my career, what what the margin targets were that I needed to hit, because trust me, I've got them memorized. Like I have been swimming in the sea for a long time, right? I realized, and I kind of gasped, that the margin targets that I was expected to hit were roughly 30% higher in recent years than the beginning of my career. So that means that customers are receiving a 30% lower quality product than they were in, say, 2008. I'm talking like a third, right? Companies are spending about a third less to make stuff for you. Uh, Maybe even less than that when we think about air freight and whatnot. I mean, it is not surprising to look back now and say, wow, clothes are not as good as they used to be. It all adds up. Because this didn't happen overnight. It was like every year my target was a little bit higher, a little bit higher. Over the last 15 years, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. That adds up to a lot. It's like, whoa, we do things completely differently now. And the quality of the clothing is completely different, even with more premium brands. doesn't matter where you bought it or what the brand says in the label everybody's doing the same thing. As Danny and I discussed in the sweater episode, the entire product development process, and this is in every buying office, every corporate office around the world. This process begins with a meeting where buyers will lay out for design what they need to buy in terms of style count, silhouette, and pricing. It's called a line plan. And we will be as specific as, hey, we need this many colorways and we'll buy this many units. I'm not going to lie. It's actually kind of fun to put together because it's like one big logic problem with a side of math. And this is where those margin targets first begin to emerge. Everybody knows they're hard to hit. And I may have even given them a cost for each item that I need them to hit, but In the beginning, it's hard to say how a design will really price out until you create a sample of it. Often at this same meeting, members of leadership will show up with bought samples. Now, I want to be clear that despite calling them samples, these bought samples are actually just things that were bought from other brands or maybe are vintage that they want design and buying to copy. Well, not 
copy so much that there's a lawsuit, but then again, not change so much that they aren't cute anymore. Yeah. What's the balance there? I don't know. I don't know if I've ever successfully found it, but as I was saying in the episode with Danny, as my career progressed, I would go into this first meeting and there would be an entire wall of these so-called bought samples that design was supposed to copy. And, you know, from moment one, this process is already set up for failure because depending on where you work, design might not only be asked to copy things, design might only be asked to copy things and not actually design anything new. And these so-called samples are never bought from a brand with a similar pricing structure. No, 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 no. That would be way too easy. Instead, they're going to be like high-end vintage or luxury brands or as simple as, this is a 500 euro sweater from a Scandinavian brand. Let's make a $58 version. Um, what? Yeah, that's going to go really well. (laughs) Right? So we're already like, how are we going to make this happen? Even though we all love the bought samples, they're so cool, right? I do think that, you know, I talked about fashion being full of illusions, right? Relying on illusions. It's also built from illusions. Like all of us sit in those meetings and we believe at least for a while that somehow we're going to copy those things in a way that is one, not totally sketchy and stealing the idea. And two is affordable, but just as good. And often we realize the folly of our illusion at some point, I promise you. So design will take all of these so-called samples and they'll take the line plan and they'll get to work on sketching and creating tech packs, etc. In our next meeting, we will review the actual real samples of these designs that were created by the factories that we're going to buy from. Leadership might say, this is too different from the original inspiration. Make it exactly like it, which raises the question, is it inspiration if it has to be exactly like it? Yeah, these are the things that you snarkily think when you're in these meetings, but you don't say out loud, right? Because that's not going to be a good thing for you. But we're all kind of like, huh, when this happens? We'll also think like, isn't that kind of unethical? That's another thing you're not going to say out loud. So (laughs) some of the samples, I'm going to tell you, the first series of product development I did was in shoes and I was so excited. And when the first ca- samples arrived, I, I cried because they looked so bad and I wondered where I'd failed. And my boss was like, no, this is how it goes. It's okay. Now in clothing, it's not always as, shoes are just hard. I'll just say that. But in clothing, you know, half the samples that show up at this meeting, you're going to be like, oh my God, why are these so bad? Why did they sample it in poop brown? Why did they give it s- sleeves that are three times the length of the actual torso. And like, you know, weird things will happen, right? You'll look at those and you'll just like, it will be like, I, I'm having a hard time seeing the potential and often design or even production will get out there and start cutting things up and pinning it to make it look more like what it's supposed to be. Others will be just like amazing. Like, yes, buy all of them. These are great. Oh my God, they're all gonna be bestsellers. I'm so excited. We're all just like giddy around the table. And then production, who always has the hardest job in this whole equation. Production is like, well, I'm glad you like it, but this has a cost of $48 to make. And according to your line plan, the target is 16. Wah, wah, wah. This is when the dance of pricing begins. I said it before, I'm gonna say it again. We all have the best intentions when we begin, probably because we also were swimming in the seas of illusion. We believe that we can pull this off. We will feel optimistic that we can create something very, very close to the original design, even if we have been through this process 10, 30, 50, 100 times in our career and know better. We always still hope that the customer will ultimately end up with something amazing that is like the original even though it has rarely happened in the past. Like, and when I say rarely, I'm like, I can't even really think of one example of when it was exactly on point at the end, but maybe, I mean, I've been through this so many times, maybe it's just too much for me to remember. So this 
is when we start making changes that will get us to the price we have to achieve. And like when I said $48, but we need to get to 16, this is not unusual. Ah, when I think of the hardest collection I have tried to get to price out in my career, it was back at Nasty Gal when our CEO at the time, uh, Sherry Watterson, who had come from Lululemon and was actually fired over the see-through pants debacle. Well, you know, so she comes from Lululemon. And also at this point, it's when like every like, fashion, like industry publication is like athleisure, athleisure, athleisure. If you're not selling it, your business is going to suffer. This is what millennials want to wear, blah, blah, blah. So she's like, we need to get into athleisure. Now, the thing about actual workout clothing, even some athleisure, which I hate that word, by the way, it's not as bad as yummy, but it's, it's getting pretty close. Um, The thing about those things is that they require a lot of really specific and often spendy technical fabrics. If you're making technical leggings all day, every day, you can make the pricing work. But if you're a fast fashion brand like Nasty Gal, who mostly sells dresses and Jeffrey Campbell Lita's, uh, you probably can't buy enough athletic wear to make the pricing work, right? On top of the technical fabrics, you also need the technical expertise because it's a very specific category to design and have it be successful. But here we are, we're going to do this premium athleisure collection that is so nasty out. So I'm skeptical, but we get the samples. (laughs) We're sitting around the table and I'm like, you know, these aren't bad. Like there was this amazing hoodie that was made of a double layer of power mesh. So it was see-through, but it was really cool and had these awesome like bell sleeves. And there were really cool sports bras and leggings and this like very unique sort of neon print. Like I was like, this stuff is pretty cool. Uh, Sure. Let's buy it all. And my production person, uh, Amy, who actually was on some early episodes of the podcast, Amy was like, yeah, so here's the deal. That hoodie, we'd have to retail it for $300 and leggings are like this because the fabric costs were so high. The specific print cost was so high. The minimums were so high. And on top of that, we didn't actually have anyone working on the design team who had experience in actual like athletic wear. So we didn't even know if this stuff was going to fit or behave appropriately when you wear it, you know, but athletic wear has to be, you know, it has to be wicking fabrics. It has to have good return to size after you wear it. You know, it has to hold up. It shouldn't pill. It shouldn't be see-through all of these things. I'm going to tell you, we ended up never buying a single thing from that collection, despite trying to work on it for months, which in nasty gal time may as well have been years, considering how many other strategies we embraced and abandoned so fast during that time period. We never can make it work. I think maybe a couple of sports bras came out of it. I'm not even sure. They were probably terrible, but for the most part, we just, it just wasn't going to happen. The fabric alone was so far out of reach. And I think about that project and how it just felt like I was banging my head against the wall because we, we were under this pressure to make it happen and it just couldn't. The other very frustrating product development experience that I had there was that we were trying to make a wedding collection with like fast fashion pricing and fast fashion profitability and fast fashion, you know, fabrics. Yeah, that didn't go well either. I think that turned into never mind. Here's one dress, right? So this doesn't always work, but often we can get the pricing to work out as long as we're not going off in this category we have no business going into, right? So, okay. So we'll start to think about what kind of changes we can make to get us to the price we have to have. In the beginning, the gap between the current cost of that first sample and what we can afford will be massive. We will do everything we can to close that gap little by little because not hitting our targets is not an option. Like you can't just be like, oh, well, we just won't make as much money off of this, right? You have to hit it. So this is when we start making changes that will get us to the price we have to achieve. We may have a conversation at first of, could we take up the retail price? And sometimes we will do that. It still will not get us the whole way there. And sometimes we will say in the beginning, yes, we can do that. 
But by the time we make all the other changes we need to make to hit the price, we end up saying it actually doesn't look as expensive, that's in air quotes, as it did in the beginning. We can no longer use that higher retail price. And the thing about these targets is that you have to hit them. Everyone has to. Even though the buyers are ultimately responsible for pulling all the math together, if we don't hit the margin targets, the sales targets, it trickles down to production and design as well. So we're all in this together. If you don't hit your targets, you'll probably never get a raise or a promotion. You probably won't keep your job. And honestly, if you ever want to get your bonus, you got to hit every target, which you do want to do because fashion people are wildly underpaid, especially in comparison to the long hours, skill, and experience required to do this job well. Wildly underpaid. So we're all in this together and we sit down and we start cutting things. It always starts with the fabric. This is going to surprise all of you sewists out there, but the fabric is always the most expensive part of a garment in the mass fashion, fast fashion realm. It should be the labor and skill required to create these garments, but that's just a testament to the worker exploitation in the fashion industry. So swapping the fabric is imperative. It can get you 75% of the way to the target price. Like that's that's how much of an impact it has. So obviously we're swapping the fabric to something cheaper, which means lower quality as well. We would always look for something that looked expensive or had a nice hand feel, but inevitably it was a poly blend. In fact, I always say, and I'm going to say it again, that we tend to think of the 1970s as the golden era of polyester, but we're actually living in it right now with about 65% of all new clothing being made with synthetic fabrics. And yeah, that is a global environmental catastrophe that's already happening and will pick up, pick up momentum if we keep buying clothes the way we do. You know, we're talking about All these clothes require fossil fuels to produce. That's the main ingredient in polyester and nylon. Uh, What else? Uh, The microplastics that they shed every time we wear and wash them. And then, of course, the fact that they just don't decompose for centuries and they emit toxic chemicals as they break down. So it's just, ugh. When you're in the process doing this, you're not thinking about that when you're like, swap it to this, swap it to that. But that's the reality of the whole thing. So yeah, most of the clothes being made these days are synthetic fabrics. What's interesting is that people are always telling me on social and IRL how much they hate polyester and they won't buy it. It's gross, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of times, if I'm seeing the person face-to-face, they're actually wearing something that I can spot as a poly blend. That's because synthetic fabric technology has gotten really, really good. Like, it's hard to spot because it can have different kinds of textures, weights, drapes, and washes that disguise it. And customers rarely reject it. It sells. And that's the thing. Retailers would stop using so much poly and other synthetic blends if people stopped buying it. After all, they are in the business of making money. This is why I'm always like, read the labels, read the content information on the website. Like you are being sold polyester, even if it looks see-through or slinky or lightweight or silky or shiny or what have you. It's polyester in many, many situations, and you're probably not going to be happy with it long term. When I first began my career and we began to shift into more and more synthetics, we were kind of always like, oh, are customers going to buy this? Probably not. Maybe they'll buy it right now because they're broke. You know, it's like the recession. But hopefully they'll they'll probably change back to wanting natural fibers again, things that are nicer, last longer, have a better weight, don't snag, all that stuff. And you know what? That never happened. And it kind of gave us the freedom, the permission to continue to swap into even worse fabric. Because that's the thing. 
The fabrics that are being used now in 2023 are significantly worse than the fabrics we were using in 2010 because, because of that rising margin target, we could spend less money to make each thing we made, right? And over time, that gets you to some really bad fabric. So we're in the process of, you know, like we're trying to get the pricing right. We might swap the fabric two, three, four times until we find one that works with a design and also meets the price target and doesn't have a high duty rate. Yeah, it's a lot and it has to be available, right? It also can't be too flammable. It can't not take the dye color well. It can't have lead in it, hopefully. You know, it's 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 a lot. It has to check a lot of boxes. If it's an item that kind of has to be a natural fiber, you know, like t-shirts, well, we might try to sneak a tiny bit of polyester in there to meet the pricing. In fact, and I would say any heathered t-shirt that you see out there, you know, like the classic heather gray, but in other colors as well, that is a cotton poly blend. That's how you get that look. And if we can't in this situation sneak a little poly into that item to bring the price down and to bring the duties down and all of that stuff, we'll just use a thinner fabric in the first place. That's why so many tees are lightweight at this point. I think it was a little bit of a trend for a while and it was like, oh my God, we make so much more money off of t-shirts when they're like thin, lightweight, semi-transparent. Let's keep doing it. It's funny when I find a secondhand tee, I can always tell if it's from like the 90s or older because it's thick and beefy, right? Not that way now. Um, if it's a sweater, we'll do open, we'll do an open loose knit so that it uses less yarn and weighs less. I mean, we're going to constantly be looking at ways that we can keep the original vibe of the garment while saving money. If we have been able to find the right fabric, we are probably, if we have been able to find the right fabric, we are probably three quarters of the way to making the math math for this style. And so now we start playing around with the trims. By trims, I mean things like buttons, zippers, snaps, hooks, all the functional pieces of a garment. Most of these changes only reduce the cost by a few cents, but honestly, fashion is a pennies game. Every cent matters when you're trying to hit your sales target. I mean, think about it. In an industry that makes 150 billion garments every year, even one penny of cost savings is $1.5 billion. It's, It's a numbers game. Zippers can often have the biggest impact here with a swap from a nice YKK metal zipper into a no-name semi-plastic zipper that can save like $1 to $2, sometimes more if it's a huge zipper. I'll tell you though, it's been a long time since I've been in a meeting where we even talked about swapping the zipper to something cheaper because production's already done that when they gave me the pricing, like trying to get us as close as possible before we even start working on it. So we might say, let's skip the zipper altogether. Let's just add some elastic at the waist, a keyhole button at the top so people can put it over their heads and that will save a couple of bucks. But we're also going to be looking for cheaper buttons and snaps too. And the number of times, oh my God, that production, seriously, bless everyone who's ever worked in production because they have, like I said, the hardest job of all and they have to deal with so, they have to deal with making the unachievable achievable every day. So it is not unusual for your production person to come over to your desk as a buyer and say, okay, here's a, here's a card that has all these buttons taped to it or stapled to it. Um, these are the ones that you can afford, (laughs) which one looks most like the original to you. And then you pick one, right? Or they'll be like, Hey, this is the button you wanted. This is what we can actually afford. Are you okay on signing off on this? And you know, like I said, you get used to disappointment over the years in a certain way to a certain extent. So you're like, fine, we'll take that button. We'll also toy with the idea of using less buttons and snaps. I have definitely been working on products where it's like, okay, well, what if we spaced the buttons just a little bit further apart and used two less? Because the buttons themselves, attaching the buttons, creating the buttonholes, that all costs money. And if we can cross these off the list, we save a few more cents. We'll do anything we can to shave off some of those pennies. 
we might even say, you know what? Oh man, this has happened so many times. You know what? We'll keep the buttons, but we won't have bunny buttonholes. They'll just be there for looks. That's that, that'll save you a few cents too. Maybe even a quarter. Let's take a moment to thank some of the incredible small businesses who keep Clothes Horse going via their generous Patreon support. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room all while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Gabriella Antonis is a visual artist, an upcycler, and a fashion designer. But Gabriella Antonis is also a feminist micro business with radical ideals. She's the one woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the world needs. If you find yourself in New Orleans, Louisiana, you may buy her ready to wear upcycle garments in person at the store Slow Down at 2855 Magazine Street. Slowdown Nola only sells vintage and slow fashion from local designers, and Gabriella's garments are guaranteed to be in stock in person, but they also have a website so you may support this woman-owned and run business from wherever you are. If you're interested in Gabriella making a one-of-a-kind garment for you, DM her on Instagram at slowfashiongabriella to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram at slowfashiongabriella. That's Gabriella with one L. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at dylanpage life and style. Salt hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand blocked, sewn and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at salt hats. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage, creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. 
High Energy Vintage is a fun and funky vintage shop located in Somerville, Massachusetts, just a few minutes away from downtown Boston. They offer a highly curated selection of bright and colorful clothing and accessories from the 1940s to the 1990s for people of all genders. Husband and wife duo Wiley and Jessamy handpick each piece for quality and style with a focus on pieces that transcend trends and will find a home in your closet for many years to come. In addition to clothing, the shop also features a large selection of vintage vinyl and old school video games. Find them on Instagram at High Energy Vintage, online at highenergyvintage.com, and at markets in and around Boston. Vagabond Vintage DTLV is a vintage clothing, accessories, and decor reselling business based in downtown Las Vegas, Nevada. Not only do we sell in Las Vegas, but we're also located throughout resale markets in San Francisco, as well as at a curated boutique called Lux and Ivy located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Jessica, the founder and owner of Vagabond Vintage DTLV, recently opened the first IRL location located in the Arts District of downtown Las Vegas on August 5th. The shop has a strong emphasis on 60s and 70s garments, single stitch tees, and dreamy loungewear. Follow them on Instagram at Vagabond Vintage DTLV and keep an eye out for their website coming fall of 2022. At this point, the garment still might closely resemble, at least from afar, maybe if you take your glasses off, the original sample that we all loved. But in most situations, we're probably still not at the cost we need to hit. So this is when we start cutting details. I'm going to tell you the pockets will go first because guess what? Pockets cost a few dollars. And sometimes before I have even said to my production person, let's cut the pockets, she already has because she knows that's going to make an impact on price. Next, we'll start working on the lining if this thing has a lining at all. Have you noticed how so many linings on dresses and skirts are and even outerwear, to be honest, are made of not very good fabric, often really thin, often really prone to snagging or fraying. Have you noticed how the lining in dresses and skirts is often not the full length of the dress or skirt, but maybe just covers your butt cheeks? This is how that happens. It happens at this step in the process. And then things will get more desperate. Then we'll start making changes that really fundamentally affect the entire look of the item. We'll play around with length. Maybe the maxi skirt becomes a mini. The mini becomes a micro mini. Maybe the pants are cropped. The shirt or the sweater becomes a crop top. Maybe we shift from a long sleeve to a three-quarter sleeve or we remove the sleeves entirely. We'll remove layers and pleats that create volume. We might have to swap the fabric or yarn again. If it is embellished with embroidery or sequins or beading or lace or an applique, we will remove some of that. Maybe we'll remove some more. Maybe it suddenly is just up in one corner. Maybe the sequins are only on the front. Like I always think this is a forever 21, but just fast fashion as a whole classic. When you would see like, oh my gosh, it's like a full sequin dress or top. And you're like, oh, I I want that. And you go in and you pull it off the rack and the back is not sequined. So you feel like, I don't know, you have to back out of every room. So no one sees that the back of your dress is just a t-shirt. This is how that happens. Like, trust me, taking that dress and making the back just solid fabric. And it's all sequined on the front that probably cut the price to make that garment in half. It's a big deal. This is really where the design changes so much. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. I can't help but think that this part of the process, it actually kind of creates and perpetuates fashion trends, not runway shows, not style bloggers, no pricing. If we only offer you crop tops, you'll start to think that longer shirts are no longer cool. If we only sell you unlined sheer dresses, you'll think that's what you're supposed to wear right now. Would you feel differently if you knew we only sold you crop tops or sheer dresses because they're cheaper? Doesn't that make you think? I guarantee the next time you go shopping, whether it's online or IRL, and you know, with like a mass market brand, you're going to say like, wait a minute, 
I see this all playing out. It's not a real trend. It's not a real style. It's a way of making clothing more profitable. We'll do other things along the way that honestly, we don't even discuss as a team because they are just an understood part of the process now. We'll cut sizes. Maybe we'll go from numerical sizes to just small through extra large. We'll agree to order more than we need to get that volume discount. I want you to put a pin in that because it's going to come back again in this episode. We'll also skip fittings because those require more samples to be made and we we can't afford to pay for more samples. We might even say, mm, it's close enough, just move to production. It'll fit someone, right? But most importantly, through all of this, production keeps asking the factory or vendor for a lower price. And they say, hey, if you can't hit this pricing, we won't place the order or We'll do it with someone else who will give us the pricing we need. So the factory will go back and recalculate to see what they can hit. Maybe they'll cut some staff for the project. Maybe they'll pay their workers a little bit less. Maybe they'll subcontract to a factory that pays its workers even less. Maybe that factory will subcontract to another factory that pays even less or uses forced labor or commits wage theft or has child labor or who knows what, no matter what. These lower prices from the factory are really money taken out of the pockets of the humans doing the work. Someone is not getting paid. But eventually we will hit the price we needed. Oh, and I think it's also important to call out, you probably, as I was talking about this, you probably envision that this process seems like we have a lot of time for it, right? Maybe a couple months? No, we had probably at best two to three weeks to make this all happen with samples being furiously sent back and forth, emails, all this stuff, trying to get it right. So we were rushing through it, just doing whatever we could to create something that kind of looked okay and would meet our pricing. We didn't have a lot of time to spend on it because leadership is already asking us to move on to the next collection and delivery window. And by the time all this product we've been trying to make work hits the stores, this whole thing will be a hazy memory. We don't get to stop for a moment to reevaluate, learn from the last part of the process or anything, because, you know, we're kind of doing the work of two to three people in the first place. And also, if we stop to think about it, I think we would be too sad, too disappointed. Imagine that you went to school for fashion because you love it or you legit love clothing and want to make cool, nice stuff that makes people happy. And more and more, you just find yourself trying to make the numbers work. Style and art are no longer part of the equation, even though we sell that illusion to our customers. I think we kind of have to sell that illusion to ourselves so we don't lose hope or motivation. It's really hard after a while, and I think many of us don't see it until we aren't working in the industry anymore. Who wants to believe that they just make mediocre, quasi-disposable stuff for 50, 60, 70 hours every week? Who wants to think that they sacrifice their personal time, their relationships, and their physical and mental health for this bullshit, all for bad, disappointing clothing? No one does. I would think about this from time to time, first here and there in the early years of my career as I was still learning this. And really, back then, it wasn't it wasn't as bad as it is now. You know, we didn't have to go through all of this to make the pricing work. We got pretty close. And we weren't copying as much stuff as we were later. But as my career progressed and we were being pressured to copy more stuff and the margin targets got higher to achieve... I was thinking about it constantly. And every time those thoughts came into my brain, like, oh my God, all you do is make future garbage. I would just sort of jam it away behind a door in the back of my brain in the most hidden corner. It was sort of this handy infinity sized closet for hiding away bad thoughts because I knew I couldn't say those things out loud if I wanted to keep my job. I couldn't truly feel those thoughts if I wanted to continue making a living. And so more and more, 
I found myself whisking those thoughts away into that closet, slamming the door super hard and running away very, very fast to think about nicer things like Tumblr or Fleetwood Mac. But over the years, it was hard. It was so hard to close that door. The closet was bursting at the seams. I could no longer pretend that everything was okay. And I really did reach a point of enough is enough. And interestingly enough, I still took a job working for Newly when I knew I was feeling this way, but I found it harder than ever to pretend otherwise. Honestly, Close Horse was born from my realization that people needed to know what I and so many people around me had been hiding for years, that we were selling a lot of people a lot of illusions around clothing. Once you know that, it's impossible to turn back. My hope is that unpacking all of this for you will also shatter the illusions that the fashion industry creates. The importance of trends, the emotional connection with brands. No, you are not in a relationship with these brands, okay? Also, branding and marketing is a lifestyle that we should adopt that is part of our personality. No, nope. What else? Value, price, all of these illusions were being sold. Let's break it all down and see what we really want to wear and buy. I bet it's going to be a lot different for you. If you're enjoying this episode, then this is a great time to remind you that my work here at Close Horse is made possible by the support of listeners like you, just like NPR, and these great small businesses. Please go give them your support. Blank Cass, or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles. By embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment, I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass, and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. New vintage is released every Every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's where St. Evans. Country Feedback is a mom and pop record shop in Tarboro, North Carolina. They specialize in used rock, country, and soul and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares. Do you have used records you want to sell? Country Feedback wants to buy them. Find us on Instagram at Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl or head down east and visit our brick and mortar. All are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns. Handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed. Made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand-dyed yarns, and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand-knit, crocheted, or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at republica.com. 
underscore unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Picnicware, a slow fashion brand ethically made by hand from vintage and dead stock materials, most notably vintage towels. Founder Danny has worked in the industry as a fashion designer for over 10 years, but started Picnicware in response to her dissatisfaction with the industry's shortcomings. Picnicware recently moved to rural North Carolina, where all their sewing and accessories are now designed and cut, but the majority of their sewing is done by skilled garment workers in New York City. Their customers take comfort in knowing that all their sewists are paid well above New York City minimum wage. Picnic Wear offers minimal waste and maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Cute Little Ruin is an online shop dedicated to providing quality vintage and secondhand clothing, vinyl, and home items in a wide range of styles and price points. If it's ethical and legal, we try to find a home for it. Vintage style with progressive values. Find us on Instagram at Cute Little Ruin. Is there a little bit of Italy in your soul? Are you an enthusiast of pre-loved decor and accessories? Bring vintage Italian style and history into your space with the pewter thimble. We source useful and beautiful things and mend them where needed. We also find gorgeous illustrations and make them print worthy. Tarot cards, tea towels, and hand-picked treasures available to you from the comfort of your own home. Responsibly sourced from across Rome, lovingly renewed by fairly paid artists and artisans, with something for every budget. Discover more at thepewterthimble.com. Deco Denim is a startup based out of San Francisco, and it sells clothing and accessories that are sustainable, gender fluid, size inclusive, and high quality, made to last for years to come. Deco Denim is trying to change the way you think about buying clothes. Founder Sarah Mattis wants to empower people to ask important questions like, where was this made? Was this garment made ethically? Is this fabric made of plastic? Can this garment be upcycled? And if not, can it be recycled? Sign up at decodenim.com to receive $20 off your first purchase. They promise not to spam you and send out no more than three emails a month, with two of them surrounding education or a personal note from the founder. Again, that's decodenim.com. Okay, so to finish out this episode, let's unpack one reason the clothing is kind of garbage these days, and we'll explore all the other reasons in next week's episode. So it turns out that every time you are buying a new article of clothing from a big brand or retailer, you might not know this, but you're paying for a few extra garments that will never be sold or worn. 45 billion to be precise. Did you just pee your pants when I said that? It's okay. It's a very normal reaction. (laughs) Let's do the math. The fashion industry produces about 150 billion garments every year. That's about 20 garments per person on the planet, but almost half of the world's population makes less than 550 per day. So they are not buying 20 brand new garments each year. In fact, many of us are buying little to no brand new clothing because we either make our own or we're shopping secondhand or we just don't need new clothes, right? So we already can see that There is overproduction happening here. Well, here's the shocking part. According to the Australian Circular Textile Association, 30% of those 150 billion garments, that's 45 billion, if you don't have a big pink calculator like I do, 45 billion are never sold. They're destroyed, burned, sometimes donated, sent off to the landfill, but What we're talking about here is a lot of clothing. It's almost like six garments per person on earth that are being made and never sold or worn. And it's wild, right? And after everything we've talked about today, you're probably getting an idea of how that happens. I mean, for one, 
we, the buyers, the brands, we're buying the wrong stuff, buying into the wrong trends because we have to create so much product so fast that sometimes we're wrong. I always talk about buying being a little bit of like calculated gambling. Like you use a lot of data to make the decisions, but sometimes you just lose, right? Sometimes it's the wrong product, the wrong trend, the wrong time. But the thing is, the fast fashion model relies on selling you as much stuff as often as possible. And that means showing you a steady stream of new stuff. In order to do that, brands, buyers, they have to buy into every single trend, no matter how unwearable, no matter how short-lived, no matter how ultimately unpopular. And so what happens There's a lot of stuff that no one really wants. It's also coming too fast for anyone to get it right. I mean, think about it. I just told you that we're spending all that time trying to make the pricing work. There's not much time left to make the actual item. And now that all of the big retailers and brands are selling you stuff at the lowest prices and bombarding you with deals, deals, deals... They are trying to remain competitive by bringing you stuff as fast as possible. Just this like unlimited selection, really taking the planned obsolescence knob and just turning it up to 10. Like the trends go so fast. They got to be the first person to offer you those trends. They got to make things come faster than ever. And, you know, this means less fittings, so the fit isn't great, less sample reviews, meaning there's less time to get the details right. This fast turnaround means that no one gets to fine tune and optimize the final product. And you will also know that sometimes as buyers, we just can't afford to do more samples and fittings in the first place if we want to meet those pricing targets. All of this rushing and cut corners leads to lots and lots of less than great stuff finding its way onto the website and into the store. And you know what? No one wants to buy it. The amount of time companies are are allotting to sell this stuff is shrinking. They need to move it in and out as fast as possible to make room for the next round of super trendy product. So items will go on sale about six weeks after they arrive in stores or on the website. That is not very much time to sell the kinds of quantities that at least in my experience, we were buying on the regular. Now, best selling styles will stay at full price longer, but this, the rest of it, the vast majority of it, when it doesn't sell after a couple of really fast markdowns and deals and sale on sale and all this other stuff, it gets pooled. And often it's either destroyed in store by being cut up or it's sent back to the warehouse where who knows what happens. I mean, I was not privy to that as a buyer. I think sometimes it's sold off to jobbers who will sell it on the off price market, but also sometimes it's just cut up and thrown out or burned. And sometimes, okay, maybe often buyers, myself included, will order more units of a style than they actually need in order to get the pricing to work with the margin targets. I say it out loud and it seems ridiculous to know in advance that you will probably end up with unsold inventory, but also know that you have to hit that margin target. It's it's a tough situation, but you gotta do what you gotta do to make your boss happy, right? And so, yeah. That means that there's going to be even more stuff at the end of the season that will be destroyed. Maybe it's a great style and most or all of it sells. Awesome. But what if it's a bad style and none of it sells in the first place and you ordered even more of it than you planned to get the price? I mean, that's, it happens a lot. That's all I'll say. It's very, this is why buying is very stressful. (laughs) Next, I've already talked about this. There are these like delusional sales plans that excite investors, they keep the stock price up, they fuel those executive bonuses. Okay, so I told you, you know, these sales plans and these margin plans, they come from the top, right? They trickle down, they're kind of parceled out by category. And kind of how much you're going to sell has an impact on how much you need to buy. So here's some basic retail math. 
the higher the sales plan, the more product the company needs to produce to sell because you can't sell what you don't have. So leadership will create super high, most likely unachievable sales plans. I have worked so many places where this happened. It's pretty common. It was happening at H&M for years and years, and they were just burning and burning clothing. I mean, like billions of dollars worth of clothing. Like, I think they have gotten it in check, or they're better at keeping it secret. I have no idea. But, you know, this is a pretty normal practice. So you'll get these sales plans from the top. They feel unachievable, but you have no choice but to buy the inventory to do it. So you'll work with design. You'll create enough product to hit those sales plans. And then when the company misses the sales plan, there's a ton of extra inventory that goes unsold. Now, if we haven't received that extra inventory yet, we'll try to cancel the order with the factory. If the factory has already made it and we can still get out of it, which you would be surprised, most agreements that retailers have with the factories that produce their stuff say that the Basically, the retailer can cancel at any time for any reason. That's how all those orders got canceled at the beginning of the pandemic. They have all the power. The people making the clothes, the factories, no power at all. This is all the retailers can say whatever they want and get whatever they want, right? So if they cancel the order, the factory has to kind of eat it because most likely they cannot resell it to someone else you know, for legal reasons, right? Other times, perhaps the product has already made it across the ocean to the U.S. Literally, a truck will pick it up from the port and drive it directly to the incinerator or the landfill. Maybe the retailer will try to donate it in hopes of getting a tax write-off. And furthermore, it actually costs money to dispose of this stuff. So if they donate it, they will also save the money of disposal. This is one reason you see so much brand new stuff from places like Target and Zara in thrift stores. And honestly, this overproduction is changing what thrift shopping is. Well, for one, because we're seeing so much of this brand new stuff with tags in the stores, right? But also because the quality of the stuff that's being made, we're not wearing it very much. It's not great. It's going off to the thrift store. And so there's so much of it. There's not a lot of, you know, so-called good stuff in the thrift store right now. This all has an impact on so many things around us, you know? So here's the thing. Remember earlier when I told you that there are a lot of sort of surprise costs of operating in the fast fashion e-commerce era that retailers didn't expect? This overproduction is one of them. We were definitely not overproducing to this extent before the fast fashion era. We rarely destroyed things. There would be a little bit of unsold inventory at the end of every season. We would just donate it. Sometimes an order would come in super wrong and messed up major quality issues, and we would return it to the vendor, sometimes even just to fix it, or we would try to fix it domestically, but not to the extent of things being messed up that they are now. Then all of this overproduction and making it work financially became a regular part of managing the business. The companies began budgeting to dispose of these huge chunks of inventory. That meant that margin targets had to be pushed even higher to cover the financial liability of overproduction, which meant that we had to make clothes even more cheaply. Way back earlier this year, in the ethics of secondhand resale episodes that I did with Alex, We explained that when we buy something from a thrift store, we are also subsidizing the disposal of all the things that couldn't sell or were straight up garbage. When we buy something brand new from a big brand or retailer, we are also paying for the production and disposal of all the unsold items. So this overproduction, this desire to grow the business more and more every year, and to get the lowest prices possible, it's all connected. We wouldn't have huge sales plans if the model didn't dictate growth every year. We wouldn't have all of this extra inventory that no one bought if we weren't trying to hit those sales plans. We wouldn't have to make clothes so cheaply 
if we didn't have to cover all of the stuff that never sold. And we wouldn't have so many unsold clothes if we didn't have to make them so cheaply and fast and cut corners and all of that. It's just all so dysfunctional. And if there's anything that I could say to you, this dysfunctionality, this is what the illusion of fashion, all these illusions that fashion creates, are trying to obscure. It's gross, right? And isn't gross exactly the opposite of the illusion that fashion is trying to sell us? In fact, fashion hopes that we feel gross about ourselves, not the industry. Because if we feel bad about who we are, if we feel lonely, anxious, have imposter syndrome, worry that something is unsavory about ourselves, we'll buy a lot more clothes and shoes and bags and makeup. It's no coincidence that many blogs and magazines, especially those with women as a target audience, but really all people, are all about telling us how to fix our shortcomings via shopping, even if we didn't know we had them before reading the article. What if I told you that actually we're all fucking amazing, no matter what we look like, what we wear, how we smell, what our body hair situation is? What if I told you that nothing the fashion industry sells us will ever make us as powerful and smart and as, and important as we already are? Because we are a pretty fucking big deal. We're all out here changing minds, spreading knowledge, building community, and getting ready to change all of this dysfunctional, fast everything nonsense. It's happening and it's because of all of us. That's no illusion. That's something that's really happening. Thanks for listening to another episode of Clothes Horse. Hosted, written, researched, edited, all the things by me, Amanda Lee McCarty. If you like what you're hearing, of course, you know, I'm going to tell you, please leave a rating, maybe even a review on your favorite streaming platform. But most importantly, tell all your friends so that they also now understand why the clothes we're being sold are kind of garbage. If you'd like to support my work financially, you have many options and I would appreciate all of them. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash clothes horse podcast. You can sign up for the Apple premium subscription, or this is a new thing. This was Dustin's idea. You can buy me a coffee. It's a platform called Kofi, K-O hyphen F-I. And he suggested it because he was like, you know, I think this is really great for people who don't want to sign up for a subscription and just want to give you a couple bucks because they learned a lot or they really liked what you did or they just want to show you their appreciation. And I was like, all right, I'll try it. We'll see what happens. But anyway, you can find a link to that in the show notes and in my bio on Instagram. Thanks, as always, to my other half, Dustin Travis White, for all the amazing things he does, including our music and audio support. And I will talk to you all next week. Bye.